How does a family survive the pain of a missing daughter? The tortuous unknown. You know, we were kind of like best friends. We had the same sense of humor. We loved hanging out. Um, it, in some ways, it even gets harder as I get older. Um, Cause. The unsolved mystery tainted by accusations of past shoddy police work. I want to know what happened. I want to bring my baby home and I'm not gonna quit. Newly minted Sheriff Robert Chody is starting from scratch with a staggering list of 100 persons of interest. So in essence, you are re-interviewing all of the people who were interviewed the first time. We're trying to. There's some people who don't want to speak anymore for whatever reason, uh, family members included. So are family members on that list? Remember, disgraced former sheriff John Maspero wouldn't allow the cooks to be questioned. Maspero knew that nobody in my family or myself would have done it. I mean, we knew each other, you know, I mean, for years from kindergarten, kids kindergarten on up. But later, during the course of the investigation, there was an intriguing event involving Rachel's father, Robert. Remember, at the time of Rachel's disappearance, he was planning to leave work early to take his daughter shopping. When Robert Cook did eventually take a polygraph, it didn't go well. The father failed the polygraph test, uh, which is true, uh, but he failed one question. Now, one question that he failed was, do you know where Rachel Cook is? And his answer is no, and he fails that. Robert's ex-wife, Janet, offered an explanation. They asked him, do you know where Rachel is? And he said no, and it came up as a false answer. That's because we kind of thought maybe Rachel's dead. And Robert had transferred that into Rachel's in heaven. And that was his strong belief. Rachel's in heaven now. So if somebody asked you, you know, that question, well, yeah, you know, it's going to come up as a false answer. Do you believe that? I do. You do? Yeah, I, I do not believe her father had anything to do with it. Robert became deeply immersed in the leading national missing persons organization, EquiSearch. He even traveled to Aruba to work on the famed Natalie Holloway case, but Rachel was his priority. He dedicated the rest of his life to locating her, and I don't believe he did that to cover for being involved. Eventually, his marriage to Janet failed. Why'd you guys divorce? He became extremely driven about Rachel's case, and I couldn't I had to have some separation from that. I, and he got to where he didn't treat me very well. 100 persons of interest no doubt crowds the field of suspicion, but some gravitate toward the top more than others. I, I told him, yo, man, you need to stop calling here, dude. She doesn't want to talk to you anymore. You got to stop. Thomas was Rachel's previous boyfriend, and he was not about to give up without a fight even pouring his heart out to Rachel's new man, Greg West. He sounded like a, 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 an emotionally impassionate person, like he's not in control of his emotions, if that makes sense. I mean, so he just was crying and like He's on yelling. the phone crying oh, with yeah. you? Yeah. So he finds out Rachel is home for Christmas, and what does he start doing? She's at this party and he showed up, and so and it, it did not go well. Um, from, from what I was told. Can you explain? Yeah, they, they like had a huge blowout fight. What about an ex-boyfriend? Was there an issue with an ex-boyfriend? That person that you're speaking of was certainly somebody that we were still interested in and until we can check that box to take him off the suspect list or person of interest list, then he remains on that list. And then there were those mysterious young men in a white car seemingly out of place in Rachel's neighborhood during her run. Somebody saw them in the area that the same time frame that they believe Rachel Cook to be in that area. So we want to question those people. 
But the most chilling aspect of this case involves this man, career criminal Michael Keith Moore, a convicted murderer who once sliced the throat of a 14-week pregnant woman named Christina Moore as she pleaded for her life on her knees. Moore would stun investigators when he came forward and confessed to the murder of Rachel Cook. He said that he was the one who kidnapped and killed Rachel and then dumped her body near the Houston area. It was the break in the closure cops, family members, and an entire community had desperately hoped for. The sheriff's department had brought me in and talked with me and said, you know, some of the things he's saying, it sounds like these facts are made to lead us to believe that he's telling the truth. Moore was out of prison at the time of Rachel's disappearance and lived nearby. His involvement seemed plausible. Finally, the day of reckoning had come. Moore struck a deal with prosecutors to plead guilty to Rachel's murder. He confessed to the murder of Rachel Cook. That was all we needed. It was a packed courtroom, the end of a painful journey. All eyes on Michael Keith Moore. I could see there was just humanity missing out of his eyes. I don't know if that makes any sense. They were cold. They were cold. No energy, no spirit there. It scared me to look into his eyes. Coming up. The charge of murder is alleged. How do you plead? Justice or a cruel joke? What's on the mind of a psychopath? When he confesses to the murder and gives some detail of the, of the murder, uh, Detectives have no choice but to believe what he's saying because who in their right mind would confess to a murder that they didn't do? And some of what he said made sense. 